this is the fourth, the first of four calls exploring governance or some word that will proxy for governance at the end of these calls. We will see how this plays out. Uh, we are um, recording these calls and I will post them to YouTube afterward. Uh, turn on the captioning as well. So we record a transcript. And um, the calls were um, sparked by a series of conversations in uh, in other settings uh, and too much kind of experience about how we're suffering from bad governance in different places. And but really, um, I, for one, have too many stories of how the sausage got made, how we got into these difficult and weird situations. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to share um, what's actually working uh, to sort of look ahead? And I think to describe what works and what might work in the future, we will probably have to do uh, some dipping into history, but I'd rather this not become a critique session of uh, democracy and capitalism and everything else uh, and try to take it into some positive directions. Uh, one way of maybe framing that is if somebody made you a dictator of a land and gave you magic powers and you were a benevolent dictator, what sorts of things would you institute or what sorts of things would you hope your people would, would institute that would help everybody make good decisions and govern well together? Um, and I, that, I'm going a little far down the narrative here, but I, I, uh, I had asked in the invite, <clears throat> I had um, asked people to uh, answer some questions about uh, governance, and that resulted in this spreadsheet, which I also gave a link to in the invite. So uh, you may have seen that there are several different answers. I'd be happy uh, mm -hmm. if everybody just explored these <clears throat> to go through what people are hoping maybe to achieve through uh, a conversation like this one. And uh, we can stop and if, if somebody wants to bring up things that are in here or raise some of you have filled out this, uh, this chart, if you want to bring those into the conversation, please do. Uh, but I'd love to start uh, with just a go around kind of popcorn style of what we think we mean by governance. Uh, and and if, if you think that's the wrong word to use here because what, of what you suspect the context is, please say so. Uh, but what do we mean by governance? And I'll, I'll start the go around by saying uh, something just really brief, which is I often talk about the difference between little g governance and big g government. Uh, and I think governance doesn't need to be government, but we always, we often elide those two things together. We often think that govern, governance must mean governments. And I think that even uh, a, a, a hockey team that's deciding how to, you know, construct a round robin tournament at the end of their season, uh, who don't have a standing rule for how to do that, are determining governance for their small group. That governance operates at all different scales and has all sorts of mysterious uh, ways. Some of these are highly structured with Robert's rules of order. Some of these are just governed by norms or habits or custom. And all of these are, are as far as I'm concerned, within the scope of this conversation. Uh, so I would love to just uh, have anybody who wants to step in and say, what, what does governance mean to you? Could I make a suggestion? that Please. we each take a moment and think about that and put our answer in the chat so we can read them collectively because it's going to be a long ping-ponging back and forth if we're all saying something we're going to react but if we we take a minute and put it in the chat then it might be a little easier on the full conversation let's do that um so why don't we take a minute of quiet and answer the question which i will uh, type in that right now and um Let's be quiet for a minute or so while we answer this question individually. Don't wait, just uh, type your answers right into the chat as we go.
So Gill writes, uh, governance is how creatures coordinate. <clears throat> Hank writes a way to organize society so that it runs as effectively and positively as possible. Eleanor um, uh, writes, governance is how decisions are made and implemented for the group. Ken, for him, governance is a set of agreements, principles, practices, and rules that a group of people adopt to create their future together. Mine is quite similar, how groups of humans collaborate to make decisions about their present and future, including setting goals, controlling bad actors, and a whole bunch more. Judy says, governance means both formal and informal rules, guidelines for how an organization works, makes decisions, et cetera. Stacy, the structure and processes needed to make group decisions that pertain to what will be supported and created in order to provide for the welfare of the people it serves. <clears throat> and Doug, peace versus violence is the problem. Avoid fixations on democracy, which might well be the wrong choice fostering fragmentation, which is maybe a little bit ahead in our conversation, Doug. Um, but uh, but thank you for that. And and one of the things I one of the reasons I called this a conversation about governance is that I didn't want to call it a conversation about democracy and how do we perfect democracy and all that for reasons I think you're pointing to, Doug. <clears throat> so um, I'm on board with that as well. Um, one of one of the it's interesting. I had a I had a call with Cory Doctorow maybe a year ago, and I love what Cory Doctorow writes. He's not only a really good science fiction writer, but he writes all kinds of stuff about digital rights management and privacy and uh, the enshittification of services and so forth. And my question to him was, I love your critiques. If someone gave you a magic button and made you emperor, what would you institute? What would you have us do? And and he he didn't have that much answer, um, at least not in a way that I could piece together. And I don't know uh, if I if I went through and, and read through his materials. Certainly, in some of his fiction, which I've written, he is posing some interesting answers. So in Walk Away, he talks about a, a way of saving an organization's memory and then improving it over time and reconstituting it if they have to walk away from a settlement that got taken over by someone else, for example. But I'm really interested in um, what works, what kinds of, what are your favorite examples of governance? Uh, and can you just maybe tell us little stories about how you heard about them, why you like them, whatever else? Uh, Dave answered the last question, governance is techniques and institutions for how groups of people coordinate. And let me go silent for another uh, a minute and then take some of your favorite examples and put them in the chat as we just did. But then let's tell a couple of stories about them and let's um, see just what's good about them, what's not good about them. So um, I'll put the question in the chat again. So um, thank you. Please keep uh, adding your examples to it. Uh, Gil, among uh, several things, mentioned Mondragon. And I just wanted to call out something that I, a little piece that I know about Mondragon, which is uh, true in some cooperatives, which is 
most cooperatives, and Mondragon is the very famous large cooperative created back in the 50s in northern Spain, in the uh, Basque country of Spain, uh, which has some 300 different companies making all sorts of products, has training, has a whole bunch of different rich, interesting things. And typically in cooperatives, individuals have to buy into the cooperative, which they often do through sweat equity over time. But then at some point, often apparently, members are like, oh, I could cash out my share and it would be worth more right now if I just managed to sell it. And the process of selling your shares in Mondragon, and I'm not even sure shares is the right word, um, is intentionally full of little frictions and is intentionally slow. You can't just sort of go on the InstaTrader and go click, click and, and cash out. You have to go through a couple steps because they've discovered that taking the time to making it a little slower to get out of your financial investment in the community makes way more people decide to stay in. Not because it took too much friction to do it, but because they reconsider their role and the nature of the, of the cooperative and their role in it. And I love that about it. I think sometimes, sometimes good governance involves not high efficiency and maximum uh, utility in a great interface, but other kinds of things about um, uh, the realization of our interdependence, about you know, other, other kinds of things like that. So th that's just a, a tiny example of one thing I like about, one thing I know and like about Mondragon's methods. And so anybody who'd, who would like to just uh, step in for other things. Hank is talking about the Netherlands, for example. Hank, do you want to say a little bit more about what you typed in the chat? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I think uh, commenting on that, uh, Gil asked a question in the chat. Uh, is that recently or has always been so? Speculations as to why. It's difficult to speculate about why, uh, but I'll tell another story uh, about the Netherlands. Uh, I first got here in 1970, and I really felt at home because it was a very tolerant place, and people accepted what was going well and what was going wrong, and had, there was a kind of community feeling about uh, this, this is our happy place and let's keep it happy. And sometime... Uh, in around the year 2000, uh, things changed. Uh, one of the reasons people here think things changed is because a lot of opinion leaders, politicians, uh, uh, people uh, who think things through seem to be ignoring an undercurrent of lots of people who were dissatisfied and their voices rarely got heard. They didn't get heard in the media. They weren't involved in uh, uh, public discourse. And from that moment, there were a number of political assassinations, uh, uh, a lot of threats to public officials. So the tenor of the conversation changed very much to uh, you, you're threatening me, who are you? Uh, you should be stopped. Uh, that's maybe one superficial story I can tell about that. Uh, and as far as Finland goes, uh, it's a small country, it's a big country with uh, only uh, a small population and people rely on each other to get through the very cold winters. And one way to get through the very cold winters is uh, learn from things that go right and wrong and uh, bond with your fellow Finnish people. And that's possibly a bit idealistic because they also have their problems with the right-wing extremists, but let me leave it for that at the moment. Um, thanks, Hank. Uh, there's a book titled Amsterdam, which is about the Netherlands that talks a lot about uh, Dutch culture and how the fact that most of Holland's, uh, the Netherlands land is reclaimed from the ocean in polders is a huge piece of the culture because a lot of the Netherlands is below sea level. 
uh, or was below sea level and yeah. some, much of it yeah. still is. And and so the pumping of water out and the, the protecting of the dikes was crucial to society. Like anybody who would undermine that mm -hmm. was threatening all of the Netherlands. Um, and that I, created a, a particular yeah. civic mindedness. There's yeah. another there's another string in here about building and basically uh, a form of uh, civic education that a lot of uh, Northern European Scandinavian countries instituted. And then there's another piece of it in the in the book uh, Amsterdam, which is that um, the Netherlands was one of the few areas that didn't have feudalism so much because they had the herring trade. And, yeah. and they invented a, the, a herring boat called the herring bus. They invented a way of filleting herring that kept the spleen and the liver in the herring and made those, those enzymes made the herring taste better. So uh, Holland herring was a premium product and merchants got wealthy mm -hmm. in a different way than in other countries. So feudalism doesn't hit the Netherlands. And, and all, all these, these are three different things I know from different sources, uh, much of it from the book Amsterdam, yeah. but they, they converge in a, in a kind of civic mindedness that it may be special to the Netherlands or maybe contagious. I don't know. I, I think, it, I don't know if you want to. It's, it's all that. true. And that's applied to the country I chose to live in back in the 1970s. But let me just give an example uh, about the water and working together to protect the Netherlands from water. Uh, back when there were a lot of, uh, a lot of, immigration from European countries, uh, everyone was brought into the community of working together to protect the country against water. When many immigrants started to come from uh, Islamic countries, typically desert countries, the conversation changed to how can we help these people coming from desert countries who want a lot of water know how we work here in the Netherlands because we don't want a lot of water. But back about 2000, that conversation changed to, oh, those ignorant people from desert countries, they're just going to take over our society and let us drown. So your stories are great. The book Amsterdam is very good, but the discourse is unfortunately different at the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's happening in lots of different places. Yeah. Um, Doug, you said you had a story about Mondragon. You're muted. Sorry Thanks. about that. My name's New Year's here. There's a lot of fireworks. Mm. Uh, I went I went to Mondragon with Jack Joyce, who was president of the American Bricklayers Union. And because I was there as part of a union group, uh, we probably had access that one people coming from the banking sector and so on did not. What I saw was fascinating, and that is that at the end of the workday, the, the culture is that your space gets cleaned up so it doesn't look like anybody had ever been there. Uh, it's like uh, uh, the hotel room had been totally cleaned. And that culture of picking everything up seems to need to be a foundation for the way that they related to each other. And we tend to avoid that cultural piece, thinking that just the ownership, uh, for example, might solve the problem. Um, thanks, Doug. Uh, there's something about respecting the space, res mutual respect, et cetera, that's baked into some of these examples in a in a nice way. Go ahead, Gil. You're muted. Fascinating, Doug. Thank you for that. I had not heard that story before, and I've been looking at Mondragon a lot. It's very illuminating. Um, it ties back to um, 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 Hank, what you said about things changing in the Netherlands, perhaps with the influx of immigration uh, from people from desert countries. And um, Jerry, to what I think you said before about friction in the cell, so you have friction in relation to exiting Mondragon. Um, and that strikes me as like the function of shock absorbers in a car that damp oscillations. It's, like, it's different than friction. It's kind of like friction, but it's different than friction. Uh, and checks and balances have that function. 
uh, in uh, in this federal system and the enormous frustration of how hard it is to amend the Constitution has that function. You don't want to change a Constitution too quickly. You don't want it whipping back and forth. You want you know something that's stable and some things that change at a certain pace and some things that change at a slower pace. Um, and, um, you know, think about the semi-permeable membrane that surrounds a cell. Uh, living systems work because the membrane is semi-permeable. It's not totally permeable. It's not totally closed. It lets stuff in with some degree of of damping of the pace and filtering of the nature of change. And um, well, let me go out on a limb here. So open immigration is a stress to that. Bringing somebody new into the Mondragon culture without being able to orient them and absorb them and let them absorb the culture is a challenge. You want them to be able to sense and feel into and adopt the norms over time. And just one last thing on this. Um, I've been talking a lot with a guy named Mike Brady, who was the CEO of Grayston Bakery. Some of you may know it as the bakery in Yonkers that became the primary supplier to Penn & Jerry's ice cream for their brownie flavor stuff. Uh, and Grayston, which was founded by a Buddhist monk named Bernie Glassman, um, um, developed a remarkable open hire policy, which to say that anybody who knocks on the door looking for a job is hired on the spot if there's a position open, or maybe even if there's not a position open. And obviously this is not for you know CFOs, but for you know workers in the bakery. And um, you know, people say, how could you possibly do that? He said, well, look, number one, um, uh, we bring people in and we give them simple tasks and they get trained and acculturated by their coworkers. And they learn, and these are people who maybe have never had a job in their lives, don't know even the most basic thing about showing up on time in the morning. And they're acculturated by their coworkers and most of them get acculturated and absorbed into the system. Some don't, and there's a way of dealing with that. Um, how do you deal with this economically? Well, they don't have an HR department. They don't do job searching. They don't do vetting. They don't do re they don't do a whole layer of expense that exists in a normal co company is gone, and replaced by this um, quick and slow process of integration people into the cultural norms. I imagine Mondragon's got something like that. Maybe it's more formal, but it can only work if people say, "Yeah, I'm in with these standards." And if they're not, they're going to somehow be either you know fired or eased out or find life so uncomfortable that they move on. But it, so it, for me, it speaks to this larger question of the pace of change. And we now have a planet that is highly stressed by very rapid rates of change, not just in technology and the movement of human populations, um, in the uh, you know the cultural blasting of social media and so forth. And so, adaptation to changing rates of change is part of the mystery in here. Love that. There's something um, important about the interdependence and trust among people in a high functioning group that may be hard to bottle, but seems to characterize the high functioning groups that we're sharing here. And, and that's not about having a great rule book. It's about some other aspects of relationship and interdependence uh, coming to the fore in some sense. Um, Ken, you wanted to take us in a slightly different direction. I'm happy to go there if you want to pose the question. Or um, you were, you were, were you about to jump in with something else? I, just, I was just observing that that um, we've gone from examples to attitudes, it feels like. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think attitudes are incredibly important, you know, and we often don't talk about them. We focus on what are the practices, what are the rules, what are the guidelines, blah, blah, blah. But, um, and, and so I pulled up from my quotes document, you know, the attitude of the Honorable Harvest from Robin Wall's Kimmer, Robin Wall Kimmer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I know some of you have read. I read it on Dave Weitzel's recommendation, and I'm very glad that Dave recommended it because it's a fantastic book. But, um, there, there is something about the attitude of we are part of something much larger. And if we care for the largeness that we're part of, then we'll be taken care of versus I got to get what I can. And if, if my getting what I can costs you tough shit because life is hard, right? And so to me, that feels like a fundamental attitude that is a polarity to be managed in any system of governance because there are always some people who say, I need to get this for myself. I don't care if I'm too... And how, so that takes us into the question of how do we manage those polarities in, in a governance system? You know, what does that look like? Um, 
we touched on this in our OGM call today. You know, Jerry asked the question of why do so many people behave so horribly towards other people? Um, and, and how do you design a system of governance that doesn't eliminate that because it's impossible to eliminate, but minimizes it and 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 creates it creates a way for it to be held collectively so that it does the least amount of damage is a really interesting question to me around for, for a governance conversation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Eleanor, you mentioned uh, refugees and immigrants, which I think are a super hot topic. Like that's clearly um, a fire that's being stoked, but it's also an actual problem and, and so forth. And it's not just in the U.S. It's all over the place. Uh, where would you like that to take us? I, I'm I'm on board with the issue a lot. Uh, thanks, Jerry, and hi everybody. Nice to meet you all. I I think the question of immigrants in relation to governance is as many facets. One of the most immediate and obvious ones is now with millions of refugees coming out of Ukraine coming out of you know environmental refugees. Um, it's flooding into Europe, somewhat in the United States. And it poses a real problem that Gil was talking about in terms of the Mondragon. It's like, how are countries assimilating or not assimilating the immigrants? And what does that mean for the culture and the politics and ultimately the system of governance in the country? It's probably the single most powerful factor that has powered the rise of authoritarian right-wing parties, certainly in Europe and also in the United States. We're witnessing it in this presidential election <clears throat> again. Uh, so I think you know we, we've got to think about how do we handle the challenge at this time, tremendous change and upheaval all over the world and millions of environmental refugees on top of the political refugee, how are countries dealing with it? How are systems of governance dealing it, with it? What kind of system of governance works? How much does having a big influx of people from outside the culture change what the culture is and change how governance happens or should be happening? I, I love that. Um, sorry. I hate that this is a huge issue, a monster issue everywhere. I love how you're framing it. Uh, I, I, agree, I agree a lot. And it, it seems like there's some a couple of overlapping really big things here. One of them is, how does any group, not even including not refugees like Mondragon, assimilate strangers? How do people come into a group and pick up the norms and process and become good participants in the group? Uh, and and that that's its own really interesting big question that a lot of people are, have good advice on. Then there's this other thing about we're going to have increasing numbers of involuntarily displaced people, whether it's for national conflict, a climate change disaster, uh, whatever it might be. I don't think anybody's doing a great job of dealing with that. Uh, we certainly see that like when when the Ukraine war bro broke out, like Germany absorbed an incredible number of Ukrainians uh, and Poland did as well. And a lot of other countries were sort of reticent. And then Northern Africa's migrations into Europe and all of that. Uh, which on cynical days I see as colonialism just coming back to bite uh, Europe's butt. Um, but the like there are going to be increased numbers of displaced people. And if we handle them well, we can diffuse perhaps a lot of the, the hatred and, and, uh, and fear that's being uh, bred on purpose. Uh, but but uh, when, when you just started talking historically, uh, it, many of the major conflicts on the planet were about those people are coming to take away our lifestyle. Uh, we have to stop the external invaders. And and that um, and it, I, I don't mean that there was an army at the gates. I mean that it was random people who had been shoved up against the gates. Uh, they, they weren't organized in any, in any particular way to take over the country, but there was this fear that the country would lose its identity, its people, its whatever. And, and so this is everywhere. Um, uh, let me be quiet and go to the queue. Uh, Doug, Judy, then Kim. I'd like to go back to the origin of the word governance in Kyber from to govern, uh, which implies that there's a goal towards where we're trying to go, uh, which seems to be left out of a lot of governance discussions. Uh, you need a ship and you need a destination. Then governance follows fairly naturally. Without a goal, 
it's very, very hard to figure out how to organize because everybody's in different directions and makes sense individually. Um, Stacy's definition of governance included for the community's well-being or the, the group's well-being, which seems like a, a goal. Is that too general for you? It's it's too general. But How would you spend what's a good well, one look like? It's also not universal. I mean, the problem, for example, Mussolini and Hitler uh, thought that in a certain way they were doing good but for their communities. And so that was for the well, the good of their own people who they were right. explicitly defining as not other people, et cetera. Um, uh, Gil, go ahead. I just wanted to question. I don't think that's a, a universal definition. Uh, that's a definition that we probably all share, that democracy certainly share. I don't know if feudal systems share that. I don't know if, uh, if uh, you know, if, 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 if crime syndicate families share that. Uh, the circle of concern is narrower. Well, let's um, take uh, early Christianity. The view was that it was economics. That is, it was the governance of the uh, monastery to serve God's purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was highly structured around that goal. Mm -hmm. um, totally agree. Um, Judy? Uh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, I guess one of the questions that I have is how open to communication an organization is and how its government's practices facilitate or inhibit the openness of the communication because the flexibility may or may not be in the governance documents to allow the expression of different points of view. So the ability to regenerate the framing of governance to incorporate voices that are different from the ones that originally formulated the governance is, is a, a, a subtle but a very important aspect. And so often now governance is like, it's in concrete. It takes an act of incredible initiative to change governance in documents as a rule and it was set up initially for stability, but the foundations that provide stability now are different than the foundations that provided them 50 years ago. So this is sort of a, it's not a tidy topic, <laughs> um, but I think it's something that we would want to consider. Not at all a tidy topic. Um, thanks, Judy. Uh, Ken? As you were speaking, Jerry, about um, migrants and immigrants and, and you know, I'm refugees and whatnot. I was thinking, you know, the history Ken, of the Ken United your, States. your connection has just gone terrible on us. Your, Ken, can you pause for a second? Uh, uh, you, oh, your is connection better? is totally borked. I can hear you now, but your video has not resumed. Go ahead. Now you might be better. Please start again. Okay. So can you hear me now? How is You're now? good. You're like the Verizon guy now. So um, as Jerry was speaking about earlier about um, all the, the climate refugees and, and migrants and immigrants, it occurs to me that the history of the United States is, is filled with horrible chapters of incredible violence towards um, Irish, Chinese, Asian. I mean, just you name a population. And yet at the same time, it's also filled with an amazing um, integration of those populations. You know, uh, one of the things that I, I find so disgusting about a certain character running for president is that this country is a country made of immigrants. It's not a uh, melting pot because we haven't melted. It's more like a tossed salad, but we, we've we managed to do incredible things together. And um, so I think there's something there worth, uh, worth exploring. And, you know, I'm thinking also of Jerry's design from trust, you know, the, the best way to uh, make someone trustworthy is to actually trust them to do something and and hold them accountable for it. And as long as they it's something they agree is important, generally they'll do it. Um, also, I'm thinking about Carol Sanford. Uh, Gil and I inter interviewed her for a call a while back. She's got a book called No More Gold Stars. She talks about being in Africa right after Mandela came to power, and she I think she was working for Colgate at the time, working with illiterate village people 
who, you know, these folks had very little in the way of education and resources. And yet they came up with something they called promises beyond ableness, which was where they knew that everyone in their village was counting on them to do a good job because they would bring prosperity to the village. And so they were invested in doing a great job, not just for the company, but for their entire village and their families. And that brought them to a level of accountability and a level of, of um, uh, productivity that was unheard of. And so I think going back to attitudes, if, if, our, if we can explore our attitudes about what do we think is possible with people and how can we invest in them um, and invest in a governance model that, that brings out the best in people and doesn't assume the worst will happen has to control for it, but rather assumes the best can happen and then controls for the variables that tend to bring out the worst. I think that's a potential way to, and I love seeing fireworks behind Jerry when I'm saying this, but you know, you, that, that's, you, that's, you've just described you. some of the precepts of design from trust, this thing I've, need to finish writing a book about but the, exactly that like how do you how do you assume most people have good intent not naively because some people do have bad intent how do you build the least rules needed and the mo best norms possible so that good things wind up happening and, and you, it turns out you design a very different system from one where you assume that most people are bad actors and what's interesting with refugees is that we're, we're, you know, there, there are a group of strangers that may share some cultural background because they may be coming from the same country or escaping the same conflict or something like that, but we treat them as individual threats. And I'm wondering how, I had a conversation with um, Alex Betts, who runs a, 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 an NGO about uh, refugees uh, years ago. And I was like, is there any way we could treat refugees as first-class citizens? Because one of the problems with being a refugee is uh, you have no papers. You may not even have documents. You may your documents may have been taken along the way or been burned at the origin or whatever. You're sort of undocumented. You, in some cases, you you don't have a country because you would be killed if you went back to your country. So now you're, you you don't have a a, a home. Uh, you can't. In many places, you can't work. Apparently, the average tenure in a refugee camp is 17 years. So you are not likely to get out of there quickly. Uh, and and what I was thinking was, why don't we give them some kind of global citizenship? Just, just make them a full-fledged citizen with an actual identity, which they can bear digitally. And this, this was an interesting use of blockchain, as far as I was concerned. Uh, we're sort of past the blockchain storm, but, but some way of, of maintaining a credible distributed identity. And then, if once you have like the Google Suite or something like that, which costs the marginal cost of delivering that to you is zero, that's the same power tools everybody else has. Uh, allowing these people to work and figuring out how to help them train up or, or do whatever else is great. There's so many things you could do if you treated refugees as complete citizens of the world who happen to be dislocated right now, right? But we don't do that and we don't do that at all. Um, so I, uh, that was just uh, on my wish list, but it, it was never sort of coming true that way. Um, Judy, I think you're done with what you were saying, Dave. Yeah, I, was, I guess I was kind of hopping back to stuff that Judy made me think around, you know, kind of messiness. And it's been, I, I felt like it was like a, a little bit of a light bulb for me the, the last couple of months around, um, we talk about governance, so we think about the, the government, but actually kind of in trying to use like a living systems meta, uh, lens, it's, it's a huge messy set of governances that we live within, right? And they bump up against each other and there's all kinds of tensions and, you know, we need something as dramatic as the federal government versus Texas on the border, you know, with citizen, you know, uh, riflemen hanging out there and stuff like that. But, but you know, I, I made a, a line about liking the state of the government in California, and I think it's really interesting. I think there's all kinds of interesting things about having a one-party state, but also having a ton of the power uh, devolving down to the counties, which are pretty diverse. And you have all kinds of weird things that the state tries to get counties to do kind of, but the counties resist and... Um, so anyway, so government is, is really messy. And I think if we try to think of it as like, what's a good government, of course, then we, you know, we, you ignore all the messiness that's so much fun. Um, and, and it's, it's kind of like any technology it can be used for good and for bad. And so, you know, Gil made a joke about, um, uh, mob bosses and, you know, the goal of mob bosses and stuff like that. I have a suspicion that what we're seeing in a lot of modern crime is a lot of really successful self-organized governance that steals catalytic converters and iPhones. You know, so these are mobs of people who are coordinating to do stuff that a bunch of society doesn't like, 
But, you know, they're doing it quite effectively. They're probably distributing income. They're managing their hierarchy. Somebody's in charge. They're picking a date. You know, they're hitting a store. A lot of good decision making going on. So um, anyway, I just I, I think the, the messiness is pretty inherent. I, I love that. And I think it's it's deeply messy. And I'm trying to figure out which principles bubble up. What what toolkits could we give people to generate highly functioning governance structures by picking and choosing from other high functioning orgs, because you don't want to just do do you know cookie cutter uh, templates of everything, um, and also in some high crime areas like favelas and so forth, the, the gangs would actually become the governance. The reason Hamas, I think, is big in Gaza, is that Hamas was building schools and hospitals for people and, and sort of trying to be the government. At the same time, it was as it was trying to wipe out Israel, and that's a uh, a really a, re a recipe for for failure in any way. Uh, but in many cases, you have uh, gangs or thugs who bring peace to the area as long as you let them do their thing, right? And and the police or authorities in the country are either also corrupt or are powerless in those areas uh, in different ways. Uh, and then we try to pass laws and fix a lot of these things, and the laws don't always break. Pax I mean, Romana. Don't always work. Like what? Pax Romana. Like, Yeah. The Roman Empire brings peace as long as you agree to be a subject. Exactly. Well, and and just looking historically, like the Mongol Empire, <clears throat> um, Mongols were really interesting because if you agreed to join the empire, if you sort of said, we surrender our city, we're part of you, they would let you keep your religion. They would take not too big a tax. They would put you on the new Silk Road and make, basically make you wealthy through commerce. Uh, they would take a lot of your people and split them into their army so that your group wasn't didn't remain as its own group within the army, but got distributed in the army, which I think was really clever as well. And it turned out that that you know people who joined the Mongols did pretty well. Um, uh, and, and they had a whole bunch of other rules I'm forgetting that were, were really interesting. There's also pirate law. There's a bunch of books about uh, pirate law. Uh, that, did you know that pirates had uh, pro uh, property and casualty insurance, basically, where there was a certain share you would get if you lost an, an arm or an eye in an attack? Uh, and, you know, they, they would split the booty. Uh, th there's a, a whole bunch of things about the age of piracy where um, there's actually a science fiction series. The f I only read the first one. It was called Quarter Share. It's very mundane science fiction. It's, it's science fiction written on purpose to sound boring. This is what life would be will be like in this future. And quarter share was the share you got from uh, sort of piracy, except in space. Uh, and I don't think this was part piracy. This was more merchant merchantalism. And then you would you would get promoted to a, a better rank, and you would get a half share. You would get a full share. You would get several shares, whatever that might be. But those these things exist all over the place, and they show up. Uh, in, as we're just saying right now, sometimes in the unlikeliest places. And we can borrow from a lot of these models. There's there's nothing to say that 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 you know something that makes a, a thing work in a in a difficult setting uh, isn't good. Um, also, um, East Germany, if any of you have seen the eyes of others or or anything like that, the, the former East Germany was a very low trust environment. And you would think that that was just like the truth through the whole thing, except, Extreme high high stress environments create extreme high trust uh, underground environments. So the way you actually got your medical care or your meds or your education or whatever else in the DDR was through extreme high trust uh, underground connections. There was a black market for things, and uh, people knew that if they were found out, the the punishment, the the, the penalties for it were really really uh, heavy. So. Um, so every all is not, it's very messy, as Dave was saying, it's all is not as it seems at the surface. Uh, go ahead, Ken, then Eleanor. I want to um, go to something that Hank mentioned on our OGM call this morning around, um, this is a, a topic that's been near and dear to my heart for a long time, which is public conversations around governance. And, um, you know, we have the technology, the, the, the cyber technology to convene large groups of people, to break them into small groups where they can have in-depth conversations and properly facilitated, they can arrive at, at um, pretty good uh, decisions and, and agreements on things and then feed those into a larger whole. But that's not being used for, for governance to the best of my knowledge right now. And, you know, I asked the question early on in the chat of, if we believe that governance of by and for the people is desirable, then what are the ways in which we can make sure that those people who agree, who consent to be governed, have a voice in governance? And 
So I'm really interested in, in how we might, um, and, and I'm willing to work with Hank and Pete and anybody else on this. And, you know, what can we prototype here that would start, let's start small, just at a community level, you know, and, and, and I think there's actually lots of examples of this happening at community levels where people come together and say, you know, here's what I'm really, here's what's important to me. And, and Hank says that and, and Eleanor and I go, you know, you've got things that I didn't feel were important, but now that I hear them, I, I agree, those are important. So we agree upon a set of important things. Now, how can we make this work? What would it look like if it was working? Not how we problem solve the existing, you know, thing that's not working, but what would it look like? Let's be imaginative. Let's ideate here and help with somebody that is, and then say now, what exists that would support that? And what needs to be um, tweaked a little bit to support that? What be in, needs to be invented whole cloth? Then we'd have a, a path forward to something really effective, I think. Um, Thanks, Hank. I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, Eleanor, do you mind if Gil jumps in to respond here? Go ahead, Gil. You're muted. Eleanor, I didn't see your hand up. If you want to follow Ken, or, or should I? Just... No, no, no. Go right ahead, Gil. I mean, Ken, Ken, have you spent much time at city council meetings? <laughs> city council meetings are are exactly why you don't try to troubleshoot the existing because they do not work very well. Not, not what I asked you. I have. I've spent I've spent hours at city council meetings, and they're incredibly frustrating and boring. I, I raise it not to say let's fix it, but that might be a, an, an interesting, discreet focus for the reinvention that you're talking about you know let's take a, a, a city you know a community of 10,000 people or 60 or 100,000 people or whatever and what, what what could the governance of that look like that's a different question what's wrong with working right now I'm not, I'm not, I didn't ask what's wrong yeah we all know what's wrong I spent like a large part of my life for five years at city council meetings yes um, I know and it's I'm amazed okay. you're still standing and I could talk, I could talk yeah. about it, you know, but the like, what could the governance system of a city look like is an interesting question. It's like not not the global rambling conversation we're having, but like, you know, here's a laboratory. Mm -hmm. And maybe it exists. Maybe it's like a thought experiment laboratory, or maybe it's a new city being built in California, although I doubt they'd want to hear this. Um, and in the course of asking that question, we could look and say, what are examples of the piece? What what it, What's the pattern language, to steal from Christopher Alexander, what is the pattern language of local governance from which we could maybe stitch together something that is a hypothesis or a provocation or a model? Maybe it gets tried somewhere. Maybe it's just a book. Maybe it's a simulation online. I don't know. But I think, it, and, and I don't mean to rush this because we've got four weeks scheduled for this conversation. Uh, and we want to do diverge, converge, diverge, converge in the conversation. But the notion of taking this whole thing and saying, what if we applied it to a specific situation of a place and a size and what could, what might be possible there? Anyhow, Let me just you. quickly respond to that. There's actually, uh, and probably someone on here this call knows more about it than I do. There was a committee in Congress recently that was all about how can Congress actually get shit done? And they did incredible things. I, I can't, I read about it and I, it's why I, my mind is drawing a blank on the specifics, Very but frank. so we, we know that, that it is possible. We have examples of it. And um, so I, I think, you know, I, I, it's just something that I feel is very disappointed with the public conversations project because the name led me to believe that they were having public conversations, but actually they're having very private conversations. They were bringing together pro-life and pro-choice people and having behind the door conversations and what they had to do for the first year was just enumerate what are all the words that trigger you into no longer hearing and accepting of the person. And we'll put those on the list. And now we need different vocabulary to talk. So that was a useful thing, but it didn't filter out into the public. So I'd like a real public conversations project that involves the public in talking through difficult issues. Eleanor, thank you for your patience. Morris, well, actually worked out great because Gil laid a framework for something I was going to suggest. And so Gil's suggesting we focus on a particular time, place, issue, and look at the governance there, uh, what's working. I was going to suggest, I don't know what the agenda is for the next three conversations, but it seems to me one possibility would be to look at this issue of immigration because I think it's both a symptom of ineffective government and a cause of ineffective government in the sense that, for example, 
it's a it's a symptom of ineffective government. We have millions of immigrants wanting to leave Central and South America because they have no economic opportunity. There are threats of violence by their government. So they come to the United States to try and have a nice life. Um, and now that that's happening in so many places around the world, you know, it's a symptom of ineffective governance that we're having more and more environmental refugees. We have not, as countries or as a global humanity, effectively dealt with the global climate change problem. So therefore, we will have millions and millions more environmental refugees. So it's a symptom of ineffective government to have so many immigrants and refugees. And at the same time, it's a major cause that is pushing these right-wing governments throughout Europe in the United States now. So it, with just a thought, if we kind of maybe look deeply at the immigration issue, maybe in the United States, um, to say, how do we deal effectively from, you know, what is what works for effective governance in dealing with the immigration issue? It's a, it's an offering. Thank you. And um, we are, I hope, uh, going to structure the next three calls here. Uh, Ken and I have had a couple calls about, uh, a couple of conversations about where to take these conversations and what to do. But I would like us to sort of formulate where we would like to focus. I very much like the idea of picking a couple specific instances and making this pretty concrete. Uh, maybe one maybe one approach to that is to pick two or three specific instances, and each of us does some work on this before next week, and then reports back in and and uh, deepens that conversation some, so we can generalize uh, what works, what doesn't work, whatever lessons we want to take from it. That would that would be exciting for me. I don't know if it'd be exciting for you, um, Gil. We've been talking about two kinds of what you're calling instances. One is is kind of a place or institutional base, like a city. How what what would work in a city? And the other is Eleanor's point about immigration is a more issue based instance. Um, I would suggest if we do that, that we don't do just one. Um, well, I was saying let's let's pick three examples. Yeah, but we you know but we could do you know we could conceivably say here's a here's a locus of jurisdiction. If we're going to do immigrant immigration, it might not be a city, it might be a state or something with a controllable border, but I don't know. But so but one thing might be a locus of jurisdiction and the other two or three would be a specific topic like immigration or economic justice or climate or what have you. And then we can kind of dance between them. I'm sort of understanding what you're saying, but I'm not sure I'm completely- um, Yeah, I'm, so, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of understanding what I'm saying too. That's good, perfect. Then we're, then we're understanding each other perfectly. <laughs> um, Judy, please jump in. Well, I'm just wondering, this is such a rich and complex topic. Would we want to choose examples to work on that are typical of a certain type of situation? You know, a community, a social group, a professional group, a, a government group. They're just, the, the governance documents tend to be very specific to the institution they're seeking to govern. And so I'm not sure how to tackle in a more general sense governance unless we set out to say, well, what are the constant elements of governance wherever it might be applied? And if we had a list of the constant elements and some of the sub elements under the constant elements, then we might be able to more effectively triage instances in terms of what applies. And this is not a knowledge area for me. So there may be examples of this already in print or available um, that would help us with it. But I'm just trying mm -hmm. to it's such a broad area. And, you know, what I would do for a national professional association is totally different than I do for a local humanitarian. So I think that's where I'm puzzled about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what you're describing, Judy, might be a couple steps ahead of us in the sense of we don't have the resources probably or the time right now to study multiple cases and to draw general conclusions out of them. Although I am sort of saying can we can we create or find pattern languages? That there's uh, Tom Atley and crew have designed the the Wise uh, Democracy Pattern Language. It exists. I'll put a link to it in the chat. Uh, they've done a lot of work on that. I'm barely familiar with it, and I invited Tom and some of his people to these calls, and I'm hoping to uh, convince them to join us because I think just even learning from what they've done will move us substantially forward in this conversation. Uh, I think that focusing on specific instances will in fact help uh, help us sort of sharpen our, our lenses and the way we're talking about these kinds of things. Uh, let, let's pick maybe three pretty different things because 
refugees are a special case of humans on the move with no citizenship, with no resources, et cetera. I think they're hugely important, but they're really different from city hall conversations with people who've lived in the city and are fourth generation of that city and are trying to make local decisions with the same people again. Those are almost at opposite ends of the governance spectrum, although that doesn't mean I don't mean to imply that they need very different governance solutions entirely. I just mean that those are very, very different settings. So I'd, I'd be pleased to, to do like city governance. And I'm, I'm very interested in what smaller cities, I just did a Google search while we were talking for the best governed cities. And it was like New York, Amsterdam, Singapore. And I'm like, nah, we need to go to the next tier down and find some high functioning smaller places and, and, and see who's doing something really different. Um, Eleanor, thank you very much for being here. Uh, really appreciate it. <clears throat> um, so, uh, can we pick a couple now, or would should we just do that in the in the conversation in the chat? What, what should we do? I just had a quick um, suggestion that between now and next call, we think about. We have three hours left. What would be useful for us to do through? Well, we could do lots of things, but what would make the the most sense? We used to ask this question of what's the simplest, most elegant step I can take that has the least amount of effort with the highest return on my effort. So um, if we think about that and come back in our next call, it might help to containerize us a little bit on where we want to go. That sounds great. Uh, happy also to talk about that on the OGM list or on the uh, Mattermost channel for this. Um, thoughts on that? Judy, do you have I'm your hand pretty happy again? with how this went, actually. Oh, this is sorry. a really good call. Thank you. I, I'm me too because my brain is all juiced up now, and I'm 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 turning over lots of stuff that feels feels like it's direction to correct. So, although Dave seems to be living in a dystopian world right now already, so <laughs> maybe, maybe there maybe there's no hope. It was the government that did it. Really? Damn. But they were happens. there to help. Yeah. <laughs> the nine scariest words of the English language, right? I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Thank you, Ronnie Reagan. My favorite and, and, quote about Reagan comes from Robert Ball. who said, Ronald Reagan was a kind of grand central station for the trains of disaster. Oof. <laughs> yeah. Um, these are meant to be one hour calls. So I'm going to wrap our call kind of now. Uh, let's think about agendas together uh, on email on the Mattermost. Mattermost channel of the OGM Town Square would be a nice place to, to do this. I don't think spawning a new a new channel for this conversation is warranted yet, uh, but let's uh, let's talk there if we can. Um, and thank you very much for this. I will post the recording, et cetera, et cetera, as usual. And uh, more soon, more next week. Hey, James, uh, do you have another minute? Uh, yes, I can hang out. I just wanted to ask you about yesterday's conversation with uh, Jamea and uh, um, uh, Kevin yeah. around. Um, Kind of assets and i'm trying to try to do a version of that conversation for some of the grc stuff and i was okay. trying to identify what was spicy about it and i think i'm probably too deep in the weeds of my own stuff kind of so i was just wondering i was curious about your reaction to what was interesting that i could kind of try to capture and move to another space sure um when you say what was spicy about it to to whom and what way and it felt like we got we got you know there was an interesting conversation going and there was clearly dis disagreement i guess or something yeah um, yeah and I was trying to figure like what you know and I think so like I've been trying to like have this framing around like to me assets are a new thing and I'm re I'm like rediscovering the means of production I know that's an important issue mm -hmm. um, like I was sort of went, went back and was like probably trying to read Marx on Wikipedia and stuff it's like oh smart guy um but uh, you know I've never read him before so so the notion in my so I think I have this underlying assumption which is you know, not big chunks of society want to make something better. That thing they're making better is an asset government in some senses to help society make things better. You know, that's why we have it. Um, and then the battle between like socialism and capitalism and kind of is like who gets, who captures the better part. And I think part of the spiciness came out in that Jamea and I were, were hearing you and saying, wow, you're using the language of capitalism to frame commons and other things that don't, that suffer under capitalist rule. And so the idea of growth and ownership and all that are part of the problem from what we were trying to say. Um, 
And so that that's where it got spicy for us is like, okay, so how do we get language of the commons, language of stewardship instead of ownership, all those sorts of things. And and then there's also this, this interesting conversation. Uh, uh, Jose Leal wasn't on this call, but he's not very happy about the use of the word governance for these calls because he thinks all governance involves some coercion and control. And I'm like, well, yeah, like if you read Lynn Ostrom's rules for you know managing commons well, you need to be able to exclude people. You need to be able to punish mal malefactors. You need to be able, there's a couple things you actually do need to be able to control uh, that are different from you know the way Putin is controlling Russian society as a counterexample. Um, so, so I think part of it was vocabulary. It was just like framing in language. And how do we find our way to, to more comfortable places to, to talk about all this? Because it, we could also talk about collaboration or co-creation, but that that gets too general for me and, and bleeds away from the topics that that I think are are interesting to focus on here. I don't know if that helps. Really yeah, yeah. So that so one and so one of the things I was thinking about this morning was kind of part of part of what I, I think I am trying to intentionally do is like capture the wisdom of economics. I you know I kind of feel like we can't toss out you know right. a couple hundred years of economics thinking that there's value in there, and and we've actually been studying some of the things that we talk about it. You know, since we we can't you know it's not like it's not like the commons were unknown. They were framed in different ways, and you know Ostrom's I think one of the big things she did was create them as a as a focus of attention in economics right um and governance and and but but we knew stuff before i mean you know and so like i don't know i was on i was in this call the other day where they're once again trashing the uh, tragedy of the commons paper the hardened paper yeah and i never figured that out it's like what are you saying that we don't have tragedies of the commons i mean like it's no, no. such a sweet little paper you it's know? A... It's like, the guy's an asshole maybe i don't know no, no. Maybe we're, we're not supposed to watch Woody Allen movies. I don't know, but no, but it's, it's, it's it's not that. It's not that. It's it's that he's over general. He's a soil biologist who's busy over generalizing and creates a trope that convinces everybody that commons don't work because there's always a tragedy of the commons. Look, people are just selfish. I don't, I don't know that and that's it, what the it, paper says, but. Um, I mean, it's about five pages. We can go back and read it, but yeah, yeah. So here, I mean, I'm going to say the notion uh, that this there is the potential of tragedies of the commons seems pretty like that's a useful concept. Yes, it's not that there aren't tragedies of commons. Commons fail all the time. They need active human management to work. Uh, and so he teed up kind of the Ostrom. So I just somewhere. shared a link to my brain where I collect critiques of the tragedy of the commons argument. There's a bunch of good stuff there. Uh, there's a, a whole mess of good writing there. You're welcome to. Uh, to go through. Um, huh, there are many, many places we could go with this. I just want to be helpful to your question. Right yeah, now. thanks. Well, I, you know, I, I was trying to figure out like how to do an hour conversation and I keep spinning around. And so, so one of the points of using asset instead of capital was to try to like remove, try to remove some of the bad words, you and know, both like, of those like words are words out of capitalism. Yeah, I suppose. I always felt like asset was like less less uh, burden, maybe. Feel, but, but. Well, so when we treat um, um, yes and no, I think I think different people mean different things by asset. But but um, uh, in capitalism, if you think of humans as a cost, that's one thing. If you think of them as an asset, you treat them differently, and that's sort of good. You want to treat your your human factors as assets. But then you're objectifying them and just treating them as if they were like the steel that goes into your mill. Um, so, so the asset language is hard. I think yeah. uh, same thing. We also talked a bit about value, and you know, uh, value in capitalism is dollars and profit and increase, and value to society is actually um, not needing money in some cases, just like sustainability and and uh, natural resources not being depleted rather than being depleted. So there's all these forces are at play there. Sorry, Hank, go ahead. Yeah, to really have an effective conversation about this, we've got to clearly define upfront what the different meanings of value or asset or 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 governance is, because you can't just make up your own words and expect everyone to understand them. Right. But we can help people understand the different words that are used or the different ways to use words and then possibly with a larger group create new language to discuss new concepts 
And that might mean that we wind up giving words different color or shading. Yep. Like there could be capitalist yep. value and commons value and social yep. value. And we might be able to distinguish that those things are different in these ways. And if yeah. we agree to that, then it lets us walk in. Yeah. When I always come across in the things I say and write is return on investment. I mean, yeah, what kind of return are you talking about and what kind of investment? And there's a lot of stuff about intangibles in there. And maybe 80% of the people think only about tangibles and, and countables and not about intangible. So I've learned always to try to help people by saying, yes, I recognize different meanings. And this one, A or B or X or Y is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and so so what I was trying to figure out, can we strip away kind of the confounding words and get to core concepts, or is that like you when you strip away all the confounding words, you got nothing left? Mm -hmm. But so in that example you were using, where the investment in an asset in capitalism leads to money, so so the notion that seems mm -hmm. sound to me is that if I invest in a piece of software, that software can get better, and that better is useful, right? And that's kind of the pure that's the point, right? Now there's a question like who owns the software, who can reuse the software, who got the benefit of the software, yeah. right? There's those mm -hmm. kinds of questions too. But the notion that I put effort in and it got better, that seems like we should be able to agree on that. Yeah. Um, yes. And then, but but you're pointing into a really interesting area because um, the difference between open source software and proprietary software, uh, they both follow that rule, but then they both have different value to society. And, and IBM, a highly for-profit company, uh, saved the company by adopting open source software, a story I can tell, um, under Lou Gerstner, a control freak uh, CEO who used to be at McKinsey, <clears throat> who somehow understood that this was the path to actually save the company. So IBM, which makes lots of profits and files more patents than anybody except maybe Hitachi or, the, or Qualcomm, um, is a good player in the open source space in which, and, and, and in that space, they have to have a different frame of mind about who owns and what is an asset and how does it work and what is its long-term value. Yeah, so I think that's kind of what I'm trying to push on. So uh, so, so, so let's not have, whether let's not do the judgment over whether IBM is good or bad, Right. but they're instrumental in improving. One of the things I think it might be critical is that the system is dynamic. It has to improve. Right. So part of the open source issue is it, if it doesn't improve, it doesn't work. Right. So I can go to, I can look at Linux or I can look at Windows and I can argue both of those are assets that are valuable, that are useful. Right. One of them, Gates has managed to siphon off a whole bunch of value and privatize it. Mm -hmm. Linux, I guess, I don't know, you know, nobody has done mm -hmm. that or IBM has done that or how you want to argue it. I don't know how we would do the calculation about which one has been more valuable to society. You know, there a lot of the, I, I've saw some recent valuations of like Linux and they seem way too low to me, but I expect they're, they're, hey, they're in the intangible, they're in the, in, yeah. in the intangible but, sex. But sex you're asking for a capitalist, you're asking for a capitalist valuation of open source software, which is well, no, contrary but don't we, I mean, to the whole back, idea. Back to the fundamentals, <clears> don't we want there to be more value, value, and if there's an approach that creates more not value, by stock market, not by stock market measures, not at all. No, no, no. Let's, let's your measures. No. Pick a pick your value by definition of value. Oh, cool. Good well, for so, society. Like, um, I'm, assuming it, I'm assuming your definition of proxies is a, is good for society. Yeah. <clears throat> um, hold on. Uh, So 96.3% of <clears throat> the top 1 million web servers run on Linux. Now, so the web basically depends entirely on open source Linux. Is the web valuable? Now, should that be priced up? Should we should we say, oh, let's let's value that in the stock market? Let's sell shares on on the no. No, no, no. But I'm saying that. That's an example, you know, and I, I mean, and I'm the huge, you know, Linux web fan, right? So, but I'm saying that that asset base exists; it is valuable to society. Now, you're going to tell me Windows isn't valuable, or I'm going to tell you Windows is a bag of spaghetti code that's been shit software for a really long time. I will say that. 
Hey, I'm still um, running on it, man. This is I'm I, talking to you thanks to Windows. I'm so, so sorry. I'm running Linux on my desktop. I, I have I have always felt sorry for, and I was on Windows for a really long time. <laughs> And it was like, Quite solid. Back, so yeah. back in the back in the day with DOS, you had to buy three other people's software to have a viable computer. You had to but have it memory. kept getting better. Well, barely. To me, it's the dynamism of it. It, it kept getting better. Oh, DOS and Windows have always been like dog food compared to other things that existed that were better. Uh, anyway, and, and that's maybe, and I'm not a coder, but, but, um, but there's sort of incommensurates being matched up here. And if you wanted to redefine how value is measured, that'd be awesome. And I think that's where we get into commercial value, market value. So for example, a long time ago, I said in a, a really smart accountants lecture about the market value of Coca-Cola versus the book value of Coca-Cola. And he said, look, I've just gone through Coke's books. Here's their book value. Here's their market value. And, and one fully one third of the market value was unexplainable by, by their book value, which was the, the amount of juice in cans in warehouses, blah, 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 the staff, the, 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 the buildings and all that. And he said, this is weird. This is good. Is this goodwill? Is this, do we just lump this into the goodwill category? This is the market being crazy and valuing Coca-Cola because it's got a strong brand. I think that goes into brand, brand goodwill or something like that. Right? So there's all these different kinds of value. And we, uh, it's, it's all also like chronological age, mental age, physical age, all the different kinds of age that we think of now uh, when we talk about people, same sort of thing. And as Hank said, if we could distinguish those better from each other, I think we'll have more fruitful conversations on this. So where I'm trying to get back to is the notion of landscape regeneration. Right. right? That's my hobby horse. Hey, Stacey. <laughs> that, right. I, you know, I think the future needs more landscape regeneration. Right. Cool. Um, me too. And, and, and I'm, arguing that if you have landscape regeneration, you the landscape is an asset that becomes more valuable. Kind of logically. I'm it is, if you in have total successful agreement. landscape regeneration, it's profitable. So so um, one of my wish list items is that we create a soil organic matter uh, tax that any <clears throat> any any company that leaves soil depleted, and you could measure soil organic matter through physical testing, through satellites, through there's a bunch of different ways maybe to get good meters, good metrics on soil organic matter. If you deplete your soil after every cycle, like industrial farming does, you're going to pay a whack load of money. It's going to be a heavy tax. If you improve soil organic matter, we're, the government will ship you money. That is a way of rewarding value creation around landscape regeneration right there. And, and if you want to propose one of those and fit it into the farm bill somehow and, and get them to swallow the broccoli and, and do that, that would be fantastic. Fantastic. And same thing for aquifer replenishment. So that Nestle and other water vendors get stunning taxes imposed on them for draining the aquifers that they suck their little straw into that they pay nothing for. Right? So the, the big water companies bottling water, which is a horrifying thing, Bottled water is one of the stupidest, worst things for 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 the planet. Um, <laughs> can can we tax the shit out of them? And and the plastic it comes in. Yes, that's what that's part part of the reason it's bad. Yeah. Now now there's box water which it uses like you know, uh, waxy paper boxes. Okay, fine. Yeah. But 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 shipping water around is energy consumptive. All these terrible yeah. things about. Let's just like make the aquifer better, create abundance. And let people drink water. The the whole uh, uh, in Bolivia they passed the law privatizing all water. So if water fell on your roof and you had gutters that led to a little barrel that was your local cistern where you could keep drinking water, that was illegal for a while in Bolivia until the citizens all rose up and said, "No, wow. screw this." And Bechtel, the engineering company, had won the contract to enforce it. So that was a mm -hmm. bad day for Bechtel. But but these are fights over the commons, fights over value, fights over all these things. And well, we're fighting... I would argue they're fights over well, fights over who captures the profit. Bingo, precisely that. We want the value. So this is this is the, I'm trying to distinguish right between the creation of the value yes. and the dispersion of the value. We want the cre and so one of the things I felt like I we got pushed up back on a couple of times the last week is even the notion of the creation of the value because that implies growth in some sense, right? There's the creation of value implies growth. Uh, no, in an economic sense. No, no. If if soil organic matter was getting better, but you were just growing enough crops to feed everybody, there's no growth necessarily implied. Growth is not needed. Growth is a really complicated issue all by itself here, 
and 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 capitalism is addicted to growth. Capitalism only works with growth. I get that. Growth is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that to feed people and have them be happy and learning and making their world better does not require growth. Which is an assumption you're making. Yes. I, and, and I'm no philosopher, nor an economist, nor any, well, I pretend to be an economist because I have an econ degree from Irvine, but not really. I, yeah. I, I don't I don't know that's all, all that, how all that stuff works. But growth is not needed for a thriving society. And if we're going to have massive depopulation, as all the curves seem to show, which scares the shit out of me, I'm like, wait, what? In how little time, if we depopulate, we're just going to go to not... Well, okay. So which one are you worried about? You're worried about climate change, immigration, or are you worried about depopulation? I'm worried about all of them. Okay. Uh, so from yesterday's conversation, one of the ones I'm really worried about is we kill off life in the oceans, and then we don't have to worry about depopulation because we're going to be no population. Yeah. Oh, there's some arguments that life in the ocean is increasing dramatically because the, the carbon and sunlight is really good for it. Let, let me just drop one thing in here because I've got to gotta go. It's late. In, me too. Yeah. But uh, back about 20 years ago, the Japanese made the distinction between growth without prosperity and prosperity without growth. Mm. And it's, it's changed with different governments in, uh, and different economic systems uh, since then. But it's always struck in my mind that you can champion prosperity without growth. I like that. I've, never, I've not heard that distinction before. That's nice. There's a book yeah. title I'm pasting in the chat, um, which I've not read, but it's by Tim Jackson. And uh, I've got it opposite, um, which you may be amused by. I've got it opposite a thought called, We're Obsessed by Economic Growth. Ah. <laughs> um, Cool. Um, I've got a I've got a boogie and prep. That was my, my yeah. Call. So you did not solve my problem, though, Jerry. Thank you. Just damn it. Used. Okay. But I really appreciate it. But thanks for going back into it, and I'm happy to keep doing that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. This was great. Thanks, bye -bye. everyone. Bye bye. Nice to meet you. Bye bye.